What percentage of vaginal smells would you say are partner dependent? It's probably pretty low actually. The partner themselves, very low. I mean, there are a few cases of women that are allergic to semen. Um, might be practices like, you know, how much saliva are they using? Have they washed their hands? Have they washed their penis? <laughs> Things like that. But overall, no, I feel like in my experience, it's not typically the partner. Because I've had, in my experience of having bacterial vaginosis, it came from a sexual partner who also had multiple other sexual partners, unbeknownst to me at the time, of course. But, um, and I also experienced with this person chronic BV mm -hmm. and UTI trade offs. Like, mm -hmm. I was just going through infection, and as to your point, like, you treat one and then another would compound with that and then you get rid of one and the other one would pop up. And Whack them all. Once I got rid of the partner, I got rid of the problem by and large. But is there some argument to that, that there are some people who make your vagina smell? Yeah, absolutely. There is some, and that goes back to what we were saying about cleanliness and about your partner's pH. There's no better partner for this transformation than Squarespace, the proud sponsor of this video. Squarespace isn't just a sponsor for us. It's ideal for us in tailoring our brand and fit our unique needs and our desires. It stands as the ultimate platform for entrepreneurs looking to stand out and succeed online. With Squarespace, creating a captivating website is a breeze, allowing you to connect with your audience and know your audience with in-depth analytics. Plus, you can sell everything from products and content to time. Now, while I can go on and on about Squarespace's impressive capabilities, I'll save that for later in the video. But if you're eager to explore Squarespace right now for yourself, visit squarespace.com slash shambooty for a free trial. No credit card needed. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash shambooty to enjoy 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. Enjoy the video. Hi, Dr. Fouché. Hi. Where's your babies? Did you bring your babies? I brought one baby. Where are they? She's over there. No, 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 your products, not those ones. Oh, my babies. Yes, they're over there too. We should have them. Let's Ow. get those babies. But that's better. Yes. Bye. I'm Courtney Fouché. I am a board certified OBGYN who now practices primarily as an aesthetic vaginal surgeon. Um, although, and it's deceiving because I say aesthetic, but most of my patients come in for functional care, uh, which includes doing labiaplasties, vaginoplasties, perineoplasties, hymenoplasties, all repairing um, the, va the vag vaginal area to what a woman is wanting it to be, be it after childbirth or, or not, so that they are more comfortable in their own skin. I also dedicate my life to women's health care in terms of helping women ha achieve better sexual responses. Um, Sometimes I do that using a laser. Sometimes it's just counseling and talking people through things that they never knew before, giving them a mirror and letting them see what their anatomy, what's going on down there. Um, and then some routine um, GYN care, such as pap smears and breast exams. You're also an incredible mom of seven. Yes. And seven? <sighs> Right. <laughs> and an entrepreneur yes. of a new line designed for women because of that persnickety vagina of mine and just being so frustrated with the products that were available. Um, I did create a line of products called By Dr. Poucher, that's me, um, all designed to not irritate a woman and to help them get through any periods in their life where things aren't going smoothly with their vagina. What is a smelly vagina? It's definitely a subjective. However, in general, when we talk about vaginas, what I hear most from patients um, when they're complaining is a fishy odor. That's got to be the number one. It smells fishy or it just doesn't smell fresh or there's like a wafting of an unpleasant odor is what I hear most often. And causes of smelly vaginas um, actually vary more than you would realize. Um, our natural, completely balanced vagina has different scents from the beginning of the cycle to the end. Beginning of the cycle is when your period starts. So it's when you have the blood flowing and there tends to be a bit of a meaty, metallic smell. I was gonna say the other M word, metallic. That yes. feels right for me. Right, and so much so like if you ever have had this happen, I've had it happen where when menstruating, um, you have your feminine products wrapped up and in the trash can and you accidentally leave the bathroom door open and your little dog comes in and is in that trash can and they're getting your menstrual products and it's because they think it's meat. It's got that like meaty blood smell to it. It's a completely normal odor and in fact toward the end of your menstrual portion of the cycle of bleeding, 
that odor kind of intensifies some, and the reason for that is your pH is changing in your vagina because the pH of blood is higher than the pH, the natural pH of of the vagina. So that balance that we talk about, being pH balanced in your vagina, that gets thrown off kind of toward the end um, as that blood has been sitting there. And that odor can e even change more depending on what product you're using for your cycle. Whether you're using a tampon, um, which tends to create an environment of kind of more concentrated scent uh, versus a menstrual cup which actually tends to block a little bit more odor because of the way it seals in the vagina versus a pad where you may think it would be a stronger odor because it's you know coming out and sitting in your underwear, but it's not being kind of trapped inside the cavity. Um, and so at the end, as I was mentioning, you might notice that smell intensifies for 12 to 24 hours before it, your natural self-cleaning vagina resets itself back to its baseline. So then you typically don't have much of an odor at all until you get to ovulation, which is usually average around day 14. So it's about a week after your period has stopped, at which point you have a new discharge coming from your vagina. It has a new composition, which is more egg white and the whole purpose of your body, of course, your body's purpose. The only thing it knows is I need to procreate. So it tends to give you more of a nutty, more, for some people, pleasant smell to encourage copulation, <laughs> right? Um, so that happens, and then shortly thereafter, your body's hoping it's made a baby. So then the discharge changes yet again into something thicker, um, tends to be a, a brighter white thick discharge that comes out, which is protective, hoping that there is a new life growing inside of you. Um, and it has a little bit stronger odor because it is more concentrated. Um, and then you're gonna get back to your menstrual period again. So there's a normal change in odor and how strong it may be, it can be influenced by your diet, by your hydration status for sure. As I mentioned, more concentrated, the more dehydrated you are, the more con concentrated the smells can be. And then there's odors that come about because of changes in your vagina that you didn't intend to have. Loss of that pH balance, um, which I think is important to talk about. A lot of ladies don't know what that means. You know, there's a lot of products, there's even water. They talk about it being pH balanced when all that actually means is whatever pH, let's say this water company wanted their water to be, they're like, oh, we want our pH to be 8.5. And so they formulate it to be that and then they test it to see if it is that. Okay, it's pH balanced to what we wanted it to be. So when you're looking at like feminine products, when I develop my feminine product, I'm like, okay, the average vagina has a pH of 4.5. So that's where I want my products to lie so that it's not too acidic or not too um, basic. So that's what the pH balance means. When your pH is thrown off, then your microbiome inside your vagina can change which can cause like overgrowth of some bacteria. And the most common one you'll hear and that women are familiar with is BV, right? Yes. Bacterial vaginosis, which is an overgrowth of bacteria that overgrow the one we want, which is called Gardnerella. That's the one that's usually keeping everything happy in check. We always have the other bacteria in there, but when it gets overgrown, then they, the bacteria that overgrow tend to produce something called amines. And amines have quite an odor. Kind of like there's certain chemicals that have an odor, like you might hear smell like um, a sulfuric smell is like rotten eggs. So um, amines have that fishy odor to them. And so that's when women kind of know, oh, mm, something doesn't smell right. And sometimes you do need to go in and, and have it checked. You know, I've always heard that before that there's a balance of good and bad, even with gut health. There's the good bacteria and the bad bacteria and they have to be in balance. And that some cases, even when you get medication that clears out all of the bad bacteria, it may not always be a positive thing either because you need them. Correct. And you don't know what's gonna grow back the fastest after that. But why do we need this bad bacteria? That's a good question. Why do we need amines at all? Like, shouldn't there just be a pill that eradicates all of these? No, definitely not. So that balance you're talking about is important. Those quote unquote bad bacteria are actually not bad except when they overgrow, right? So like even within all of us, we have yeast. It doesn't mean we have a yeast infection. They're not overgrown, but they are producing proteins that keep our fluids in our vagina in balance. So it's 
They're called bad, but it's only because they get a bad rap when they overgrow. So they're not like deadly bacteria. You just want to keep them in check. Um, and so you mentioned medications. Sometimes this happens. You have a UTI. You're put on an antibiotic to kill the bad bacteria that are causing an infection in your urinary tract system, which unfortunately kills off the good bacteria in your vagina, allowing the bad yeast to then overgrow and create a yeast infection while you're dealing with a UTI. Um, and so really that balance is important to keep the quote unquote good bacteria in check with the bad bacteria. I have a theory on this and I'm curious to hear your answer to it. Who has smelly vaginas? Who? Yeah. We're always trying to catch the smelly vagina bandit. I feel like that's the case, right? There's, right? there's this myth of this woman whose vagina stinks and we're all trying not to be her and everyone's trying to avoid that storyline and that plot, but we talk about her all the time. Who is she? So smelly vaginas, as I mentioned, occur when there's an imbalance. So, but it also occurs on your period. And it occurs on your period, correct, when everything is in balance and it's natural and it's good. So part of, I think, what's important is to kind of change the storyline, right? How about we accept the smells that come from us, yet, of course, understanding when it's overwhelming. There are women on their period where their metallic meaty smell is like through the roof, <laughs> like a little meter that was like, who's on their period? Woo, you are on your period, right? But there's not always something you can do to control that. There's nothing, and it's, you're fertile and it's, it's part of your natural cycle. Um, there are other women who will do things to their vaginas to try to prevent them from being the smelly vagina, which unfortunately they don't realize they're causing more odor, right? Douching very much can throw you off balance. Um, another big thing that's out there is this vaginal steaming. Um, and does that really improve your vaginal health? Well, I haven't seen any really good studies that tell you for sure, but I can tell you that the design, the design of the vagina is for it to keep itself clean without us putting anything in there to change it. Um, sparkle glitter lotion. It's been a big trend that I've seen. Many of my patients come in and it's, you know, I don't know if they're prepping for me or if this is their daily routine, but there's like this sparkle glitter lotion, which unfortunately none of them are usually using clean products like the manufacturers. And that in and of itself tends to, can very frequently cause irritation. Sparkle glitter on the mons pubis or on everything. The labia, like spread the vaginal oh. orifice, everything is... <laughs> it's sparkling. It's ready. <laughs> um, so yeah, different lotions can definitely do it. Sometimes some surprising things that people don't realize that can change your odor, even just having sex, right? When you have sex, you produce even more different types of discharges or lub natural lubrication. Um, the penis itself, ejaculation tends to be basic. Um, so that changes the pH in the vagina. And so if you after ejaculation, allow the semen to sit inside of you for a certain period of time, you are changing the pH and you may be more susceptible to things like bacterial vaginosis just from that pH change. So, yeah. Can I ask you a personal question? Please do. Have you ever been the smelly vagina woman? I have been a smelly vagina, definitely. Another aspect to smelly vagina can also have to do with not necessarily the vagina itself, but the skin around it and the apocrine gland, glands. So when you sweat, everybody's sweat is different. And at certain times of the month, my sweat down there is not pleasant. <laughs> Let me tell you, it doesn't stop me from working out. I like to get my workout on, but yeah, definitely. It happens to, I don't think there's a woman on this planet who hasn't had a smelly vagina. Yes, and I think that's what I would like <laughs> for us all to embrace. That idea that instead of us trying to do this boogeyman Bigfoot hunt, for the person who has this problem, who has never heard of washing before or doesn't drink water and is only drinking Diet Pepsi and Red Bull, like that that isn't the person that we're talking about. It's everybody. Like I have gone through both periods of extreme bad smells and on a monthly basis, when I'm on my period right now, I wouldn't bottle up this scent. 
you know, but there are definite times where I'm going to the bathroom and I can smell my underwear and I like press it to my face. I'm like, this is incredible. Correct. And I'm both of those people. So I feel like if women can frame it more positively instead of like, ooh, who has that stinky vagina, right? Um, that in general, having a positive mindset about your vagina is definitely good for vaginal health. That also reminds you too of having like a unifying concept. Yeah. Like looking at it as a shared experience, not as a siloed shameful experience. Like if you're having an off time, that should be an invitation to go to your mother, to go, which I didn't go to my mom when I had the smell. Um, yeah, it just didn't feel like it was like a bonding moment. It felt right. like a shameful go into hiding moment. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm trying to say. That's how our society has always been as far as I know. I certainly didn't talk to my mother about sex or vaginas. I mean, for heaven's sakes, I had a baby at 15 because I didn't know anything and I didn't feel comfortable talking to anyone about it. So I've made a conscious effort to change that for my children and to try and change that dialogue for every woman that comes through my door. Like some of them come in and they're sweating profusely. Their hands, their vaginal area, they're so nervous to talk about their vagina. But all of the women that come through my door, by the time they're leaving, they are not sweating, they're smiling, they're happy. They're like, who knew? Who knew I could have such a, um, a positive conversation about my vagina and feel so good that I'm like not afraid to start bringing it up to other people. And I said, you know, good, that's the way it should be. And the more of us, that start talking about it as a normal topic, the less shame there'll be and the less taboo the vagina will be. And I feel like the happier we'll all be with our vaginas. Okay, little pause here, but let's just dive into why Squarespace is so impressive to me. First, their appointments feature has been a game changer for us. With our schedules being quite hectic, this feature streamlines our day-to-day -day management beautifully. And speaking of beauty, you've got to check out their fluid engine. It makes creativity so easy and it's accessible from your browser or even your phone. And are you thinking of selling products? Squarespace has you covered here too. They assist with everything from product design to production to inventory and shipping. Plus their mailing list management and analytics tools are top notch. And the ease of designing and customizing your website is simply amazing. If any of this sparks your interest. Visit squarespace.com slash shambooty to start your free trial. No credit card required. And when you're ready to launch, go back to squarespace.com slash shambooty to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. Remember, that's squarespace.com slash shambooty for your free trial and 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. Now enjoy the rest of this video. Vaginas, mine in particular, very persnickety. I've always said that's how it is. You know I love that. It's, it's just the truth. I love that word. <laughs> and so if you're introducing things into it, even like, you know, sometimes people come in and they've had vaginal odor and it's a piece of toilet paper that's been stuck up there because they were trying to clean out the inside of their vagina. And you know, toilet paper is not the strongest thing and a little piece gets stuck in there and then festers. I've had condoms found inside vaginas that they don't know when the last time was that they had sex and it slipped off and it's been sitting there and it's been festering. So I don't want to say that a smelly vagina is never a cause for concern. Please, if something's out of the ordinary or smelling bad, please go get seen. You would be surprised what can be found up there and that can be easily taken care of. But for the vast majority of us, for most of the time, most of the smells are normal. Can you rank in order of frequency causes for irregular foul smells? Irregular foul smells? Absolutely. Number one, hands down, is bacterial vaginosis. Um, there's very few women that haven't had it, even if they knew that they did or not. If you've had a fishy odor combined with a grayish white discharge that sometimes is frothy, more than your usual, you've probably had bacterial vaginosis. And whether it was resolved on its own or with medication, that's number one. Um, another odor that's common is urine. Um, sometimes cleaning doesn't happen quite as nicely as you want or you're having leaking of urine that you weren't aware of. A high percentage of women, over 35% of women age 25 and older, have urinary incontinence. They're not all aware because sometimes it's so little that you don't smell it, you don't feel it until the end of the day and then you're like, ooh, I've got a urine smell. So that's a very common one as well. Um, another common odor um, producer would be a yeast infection. Um, it doesn't present with that fishy odor, but it definitely still has a 
distinct odor to it. I kept my finger on what I would call that smell, but it has a distinct odor to it as well. Um, and then the next one would be menstruation. Like I said, that meaty metallic, every woman can expect to have it every single month. Um, but that's not something negative um, unless the odor changes and becomes very strong without using a different product inside of you. Then it can be an indication that something's going on like a polyp or some type of abnormal bleeding. How much of a factor is diet and lifestyle? It can be actually a significant factor depending on how much you're deviating from a quote unquote healthy lifestyle. So as I mentioned, number one is hydration, right? If you are, like you mentioned, drinking Red Bulls and not getting a lot of water in, you definitely can be throwing off your pH balance. Um, eating certain foods, while for men's ejaculate can really change things for them a lot, it can change things for us, but not quite as drastically as you would expect from a man. I'd say that's important to ask because you have copious amounts of experience right in the face of vaginas. This is what you do all day long. Yeah. Can you tell a person's diet and lifestyle by the smell of their vagina? No, I can't tell you for certain. Like, You haven't gotten to a point where you're like, oh yeah, this one's vegan for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I don't know a vegan smell to a vagina. I have had the unfortunate uh, consequences, or not consequences, but instances where patients come in and I can smell they have cancer. Um, you know, dogs can smell cancer, whatnot. I told you I've got a really good sniffer. Unfortunately, there's a particular odor that comes from women's vaginas when they have like a uterine cancer, but not a vegan one yet. What percentage of vaginal smells would you say are partner dependent? It's probably pretty low, actually. The partner themselves, very low. I mean, there are a few cases of women that are allergic to semen. Um, might be practices like, you know, how much saliva are they using? Have they washed their hands? Have they washed their penis? <laughs> Things like that. But overall, no, I feel like m in my experience, it's not typically the partner. Is bacteria vaginosis a sexually transmitted infection? Not technically. Can it come about more often depending on the partner that you're with? Yes, because everybody's pH is different and how long you're leaving semen in your vagina, as I mentioned earlier, can contribute to developing bacterial vaginosis. Women that have a very delicate balance in their vagina, like one little thing throws them off and they've got a yeast infection. Oops, I had chocolate cake. My blood sugar spiked and I have now um, a yeast infection and overgrowth. Someone like that that's more sensitive could be more sensitive to the change in pH that happens when semen sits inside your vagina. So it's not transmitted like the man has bacterial vaginosis and he's giving it to me, right? Or like the man has herpes and he's giving it. That's a transmission as opposed to an influencing, excuse me, an influencing factor. Because I've had, in my experience of having bacterial vaginosis, it came from a sexual partner who also had multiple other sexual partners unbeknownst to me at the time, of course, but, um, and I also experienced with this person chronic BV mm -hmm. and UTI trade-offs. Like mm -hmm. I was just going through infection and as to your point, like you treat one and then another would compound with that and then you'd get rid of one and the other one would pop up. And whack -a -mole. Once I got rid of the partner, I got rid of the problem by and large. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of that also had to do with a period of time where I wasn't having sex at all. So I was able to return to a baseline, but mm -hmm. is there some argument to that, that there are some people who make your vagina smell. Yeah, absolutely. There is some, and that goes back to what we were saying about cleanliness and about your partner's pH. So every semen's pH is going to be a little bit different as every vagina is. Vaginas in general are 3.8 to 5. That's why I said the average may be 4.5. So depending on where you live there and where their semen lives, every time you had sex, let's say if semen was involved, that could change the pH in your vagina. What would you do though? In that case, if I was to go back in time and I had a partner who was constantly giving me, throwing my pH off, mm -hmm. um, what would be the solve for us? Potent depending on what we determine the cause to be, but potentially use of condoms if that's an option, if semen was truly the issue, making sure that safe practices like, is your penis clean? What kind of wash did you use on your penis? Again, persnickety vagina, if my husband was to use a particular wash and then we were to have sex, I would be on fire and we'd be out of commission for a couple of weeks. It wouldn't be good. Um, lotions as well. Um, so making sure that it's clean, um, potentially not letting it sit, right? Are you going to sit in bed and have the afterglow and relax? Or are you going to be like, oh, that was great. Let me get up and get that out of me so that I don't then 
allow it to create an environment where I'm going to end up with BV. So maybe some lifestyle changes could make it so that you guys could have fun without having consequences. So your advice wouldn't be get rid of the person? <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't get rid of them. I did and it worked out great. <laughs> um, okay, so I want to ask a quick question about getting rid of semen because you've mentioned that several times. Yeah. Just going to the bathroom is usually good enough because it's not what's on the outside that's going to be irritating you, it's what's, in, what's up inside. For women who have a healthy pH balance, who don't have any infection going on, um, who are using products that work great for them, is it possible that they can just stink incidentally because they're nervous about the experience that's about to happen? Oh, absolutely. So that goes to, similar to how I can stink when I'm uh, working out. The sweat glands and that nervousness can absolutely produce an odor that makes them smell unpleasant, 100%. Can hair contribute to smell? It can. The sweat glands and the hair glands that are there, when you have hair, that hair can trap the, the sweat and the odor, allowing it to get stronger. So yes, hair can make you smell a little bit stronger for a little bit longer, but it can also be taken care of by showering more regularly if it's something that's bothering you. And then on the flip side, because hair does trap scents, can you wash it with nice scented shampoos and it have the opposite effect where it actually maintains positive smells for longer. It can, absolutely. So, yeah, you just... Which side of the coin do you want to see? Right. <laughs> All right, penis care. What do people with penises do to have non-smelly penises and to help women not have smelly vaginas? Right, well, let me preface this by saying I do not see men and I am not a penile specialist, no urologist over here. But I can say in general, obviously, daily cleanliness is important. How do you get the best out of your vagina? I recommend that they take care of her, that they have the mindset of it's not just there. Just like, I don't know, for me and for you most likely, I lotion my skin every day. Most women don't think about taking care of their vagina every day in the same type of way. So I think that's important. Exercising is so important for your vagina. And I don't mean that just in terms of, all doctors love to say, you need to lose weight, it's gonna cure everything, right? I mean it in terms of giving it tone, vaginal exercises that you can do that make it strong so you don't leak, you don't have the urine smell from leaking. Um, you're not creating a moist environment that can foster more odors because the balance is off. So you wanna definitely exercise your vagina. Um, be it as simple as Kegel exercises, that's better than doing nothing, or elevating it some more by doing exercises with a device such as an LV device that you can insert, that you can use your app, and you can really go to town and do some physical therapy on your vagina at home. Do you do it? I do. Yeah? I have to say, it makes all the difference for me. Um, in terms of just daily life, I have patients that come in and they complain that just getting in and out of the car, they're experiencing vaginal air coming in and out, that it's audible and that they find it embarrassing, or exercising in certain positions, or leaking, um, or during interca intercourse with their partners, they just don't feel it anymore, but they don't want to say anything to them because they don't want them to feel bad. Where this is something that you can do for yourself. Take your own power back and get those muscles to be tight enough, and not only just tight, because it's not always about tightness, as it is about the cue, the mental cue of there's something in my vagina and I'm going to move it and I'm going to squeeze it and I'm going to be present with just me and my vagina and know what's going on in there, which can really help when it's time to go and have intercourse instead of just going, oh, I just don't feel anything. You're in tune and you know what to look for and that can help you engage. Can strengthening your vagina minimize queefing? Yeah. It certainly can, to an extent. Even if someone like that were to do their muscle exercises, it can help you narrow the opening before the outside, which can reduce the amount of air that can come in and out. That's fascinating, because yeah, I've definitely noticed there's some positions afterwards, I would like a whoopee cushion. Just... <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so I'm like, Absolutely. wow. Absolutely. That's now that's that's different. normal. <laughs> yes. And now normal. Right. Yes. <laughs> I, when I interviewed with you and I told you about this line that meant so much to me of because sometimes working on ourselves in these ways can almost feel like a betrayal to self because we're supposed to accept that vaginas make sounds, that vaginas sometimes smell, that vaginas aren't always comfortable. So how do you go about figuring out if you're being too self-critical 
or if there actually is a problem. I think the biggest thing is to identify that if it's on your mind and bothering you regularly, it's interfering with your life and your confidence, then it's a problem. If it's enough for you to be brave enough to come to see me, then it's an issue. You know what I mean? Women have to build up confidence to come to someone and say, hey, this is going on. Because there's so many women out there actually who have the issue and they don't say anything. They suffer in silence, but it's bothering them. So I would say if it's bothering you, have it addressed. We see these headlines in the news that there's been like a 400% increase. This is just a number I'm pulling out of my ass um, in labiaplasties. And it's usually a tied to something negative. Like, look what the porn industry has done. Look at how people are, have not accepted themselves. Look at young girls today being influenced. Um, when you see that increase, do you think? I actually see it and I'm happy that women are finding out there's something that they can do. Because like I said, at least 90% of my patients, it's functional, it's painful. And these people that I've, I tend to find people that are criticizing it tend to not have big labia, or if they do, it's not bothering them, which great. If your labia are big and you love them and they aren't bothering you, wonderful. You don't need to come see me. But for these women that have had to build up the courage, usually for 10 years, to come in and address the issue, I mean, they are really relieving a huge stress off of themselves by coming in and having it taken care of. It's a big deal. I mean, if it's on their mind to where they're thinking about their labia all day, come on, that, I don't think that it should then be lumped into, it's about porn. I've never had a patient come in and say, oh, I was watching porn. Is there a too young a little caveat to that, but yes, you want to make sure when you're addressing this issue that find out when they first started their period because puberty is important because as I mentioned, when those hormones are going up, it takes time for them to stabilize. So you don't want to go reducing a labia. Someone just started their period a year ago because it's probably not done growing. So too young would be somebody who's just started their period um, unless, and unfortunately this happens too, it's been an, an injury of some sort. They split the beam, um, they were raped or molested, like something happened and they aren't whole down there again, then that would be a reason to do it for somebody younger. And there's no upper age limit. My eldest patient was 76. Wow. Mm -hmm. For labiaplasty. It's interesting to me because when you hear about it framed through your vantage point, it feels like a success story because I assume the reason why it's grown 400% is because it was at zero at a certain point in time. Right. So people just had to live with it. So the fact that there is an option now that people are utilizing, how do they report that their life has changed? Sometimes they've even had a ghost labia where they go to tuck and they're like, oh, I don't have to tuck it anymore. I totally forgot. I don't got to roll it up, shove it in. Yeah, it's wonderful. But I have to say they're all so happy. Number one, a uh, statement that I have post-operatively is, why did I take so long to do this? Why was I fretting over this for 10 years? Like, I've been researching you, Dr. Poucher, for seven years, and I finally made it in here, and why did I wait so long? The balm in particular, fantastic for getting rid of any irritation and keeping you at a happy baseline. So that's something a lot of women will use daily. Um, I also, as a surgeon, was frustrated with the post-surgery care product lines that were out there. So you have two wonderful babies. I don't know if you experienced this, but I know when I had my babies and lots of my patients did before I had this, we would send them home with um, a little spray bottle um, that they would use that's supposed to numb the area to make you feel better. But to use it, you first have to hold your breath and go, okay, this is going to sting. <laughs> which is like the worst. And if something stings, then it's actually not doing good for your skin. That means there's alcohol in it. So I created a spritzer, which is really great for my patients that are healing um, from surgery, as well as women that are experiencing atrophy or any type of irritation. And it smells wonderful. It's infused with essential oils, um, lots of healing nutrients like lavender oil, shea oil, um, there's chamomile in there, oat kernel, like everything that like it's happy for the vagina. So we have a wash, we have wipes, a CBD spritzer for those who have a little anxiety that they'd like to calm. 
It's been wonderful. It's been an adventure. It's like a whole no, new world for me going into developing a product line de novo. Well, when I first met and chatted with you, I just fell in love with you as a person, as an educator, as an expert, as a doctor, as a leader. And when you told me you're making a product line, this is an area that I'm so passionate about because I too have a persnickety vagina. <laughs> and I know what it's like to be a victim of that. Um, I know what it's like to be in love with her and I know what it's like to feel like I'm hated by her. Mm -hmm. And when you find a line that works, it's just like, yes, one less thing for me to worry about. And it becomes something that's not just a part of your daily care, but just a part of your thoughts of wellness in general. It's just so closely tied to how I see wellness. And so I was so excited to see what you'd come out with. And when I finally got my hands on them, I loved them. I cannot make a big enough endorsement about this. I'm just gonna go over it quickly and say that the foaming wash, something that I use for myself, as well as my daughters, as well as my husband. So to Love your point it. about your partner also being mindful of what they're using on their skin, because it also is precious, mm -hmm. you really, I don't know, I'm, I, I should be product agnostic, but I'm just going to say as an Axe body wash person who's been scorned by that before, because mm -hmm. I was at my parents' house, that's all that was available. Yeah, I don't want my partner using that on their sensitive bits either, right? right. I want there to be an extra bit in there. And this balm, not only do I use it on my vulva, I use it on my cracked heels. Yes. My daughter gets like a lot of like rashes around here. So I use this underneath here to repair the skin. Mm -hmm. It is a beautiful all around product that I go through like butter. I put it on everything. And the spray, exactly to your point, I use it whenever I'm feeling slightly off. I'm just feeling like, oh, I just feel a little itchy because I know myself. I know when I'm having days that just don't feel like my favorite days. And I also use it after sex. So these are products that are just great in daily use. The wonderful wipes are just there because, well, wipes are part of my life. Like I have babies. So right. there's literally 20,000 wipes in each drawer that you go in, yeah. but this is in my personal intimate drawer. So I know I have something special just for me, but thank you for making this line. I'm glad we got to show some love to it. 